Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. If you would turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 40. Psalm 40 is a psalm of David. It says, For the choir master, a psalm of David. So some would believe, and it may be true, that it was written for the specific purpose of to be sung in worship. And Psalm 40 has two distinct parts. The first part, David praises God for removing him from the pit and the mire and the miry bog. And the second part, David asks for continuing help because this one sin is not all that is going on in David's life. And so it starts in verse 1 where it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and that is kind of the key to David's strategy in this psalm, is that he will pray for what is right, and then he will wait. And that, as I've said many times before, and as you know, patience and waiting do not mesh with modern society. We want what we want, what we want, and we want it yesterday. We do not want to wait for anything. We want instant delivery. We want instant health. We want instant fixing of everything that is going on. And in fixing everything that is going on, we want to be happy. And that is why when lotteries get up into the one point whatever billion range, People will go and buy more and more tickets because they feel that the instant influx of $800 million or so will fix all of their problems. Instead of trying to work and save, they would rather have an instant fix. And that is not the, the tone of the Bible when Paul was giving the Galatians the list of the fruit of the Spirit. It is love, joy, peace, patience. So patience is a Holy Spirit-empowered attitude, device within us. And if you are an impatient person, the first thing you need to do is pray about that and say, Lord, what in my life is causing this impatience? Because if you are impatient and it brings you to a place of selfishness and it brings you to a place of self-centeredness, where all of your desires come before the desires of others or the desires of God, then that is a sin. To reject patience, God-given patience, is a sin. And so you need to ask for forgiveness, (coughs) excuse me, and try to move beyond that. But what did he wait patiently for? He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet on rock, making my steps secure. And when we think of the poetry, the metaphor, if you will, of David being in a pit of destruction, a miry bog, he was not literally stuck in a bog. He was in a bog of a circumstance or of a sin. He was in a pit. And sometimes we can get involved in something, and whether it be sinful or not, perhaps you are helping somebody do something, and then you get so involved in that, you try to take over and control what they are doing because you know best, and you've kind of entered into sin at that point. But that can create a sin upon a sin upon a sin as we try to move things through and say, well, as long as this, until this is done, I'm just going to keep down this track. And what happens is you, you do what is called a spiral into a pit of sin where one sin can cover up another sin and not to bring politics into everything. But we see it before, and Richard Nixon himself said, It is the cover-up that is worse than the crime. That when we sin and we don't want to admit it because we think we're being helpful or or we like it or we're self-centered or something, and we try to cover it up by lying or something, then you can end up in a spiral 
of sin. And it is not only politicians who can cover things up. Family members can cover things up. We try to cover it up from each other. And when we try to cover up our sin from God, then we're in real trouble. And what can happen is we can get into a function of sin where we're just into this, not really a habit, but just things that we do because we're concerned about ourselves more than others. And the only way out when we look at our lives and say, well, I'm I'm so deep in this, I must not be saved. And that is a lie of Satan. If you are truly saved, you can still get caught in a web of sin. And the thing to do at that point is not to give up, is not to leave church, but to cry out to God, to ask for forgiveness, because Christ died for all of those sins that you're wrapped up in. And God is the only one who can pull you out of that pit of sin and that miry bog of sin. And we do not know if David had a pit of sin, but that is one thing that we can fall under. And the other, another one is that there is a pit of defeat, that there are some people, and a lot of these people really love the lottery. They say no matter what they try, they can't win. And so only if they get a huge sum of money will they be able to win, it seems. And I, they interview people on TV who, who do not win, and they're not hopeful. They seem to be defeated. And I have to wonder if they're putting all their hopes into money, how much of their lives are focused on the defeat. Uh, Christians can also get involved in a pit of defeat where we try things that God is not leading us into or we try things to advance our own agenda and we get involved in a pit of defeat and God is the only one that can get us out of that. The third is a pit of bad habits. There are good habits and bad habits and somebody has said that good habits are a great way to save time. For example, You don't have to relearn how to brush your teeth every time you brush your teeth. Hopefully it's habitual that you automatically know which end of the toothpaste tube to squeeze and you know how to do things with that and that has become because you've been doing it since you were a wee tot. It has become habitual how you brush your teeth and how you take care of that sort of dental care along the way. And that is a good habit. But if you have the habit of always being defensive around a certain person, of always reacting instead of responding to a certain person, a, a having fits of anger or being triggered into anger can be a bad habit, can be something that would push people away. And if we are involved in an attitudinal bad habit, we can only come to God and say, God, change that habit. It has been said that you have to do something 40 or 45 times in a row to create a habit, but you have to do something 400 times to break a habit, that it is very difficult if we have ingrained in our minds to respond sinfully to somebody, that that is a habit that only God can break. God can break our attitudes. God can break our habits. And if you want a better habit. I have talked to people who say, I I wish I had a habit of reading the Bible more. Well, you can pray for that too. You can pray for good habits. You can pray that God will put you into a situation where the Bible is there and you have the time to read it and that that would come every day or a couple times a week or whatever you can do. And the last is a pit of circumstances. Uh, There are things that can happen to you that, that are outside your control. And when I read this, I thought of the church in China that for some time, a couple years ago, for maybe as close as 25 years, China seemed to be moving toward being an economic powerhouse. And they weren't interested in uh, controlling the behavior of people as much as long as the Chinese government and the Chinese people were making lots of money 
making phones and things like that. They seem to be accepting. And so Christians, seeing this apparent freedom in some places, they were actually allowed to build churches and to meet together openly. In one place, they were allowed by the government to print Bibles in limited quantities. And people were looking at that and saying, wow, China may be moving toward a place of religious freedom. But then the president of China changed his mind, and he said, no, I'm going to double down on the the communist view of life. And now he's bulldozing churches, and he shut down Bible printing presses, and he's actually arrested a pastor just for being a pastor. And so these Christians did not do anything wrong. They were following the truth of Scripture, and they were proclaiming what God was saying, and the government seemed to let them do it, but then the government changed their mind and shut them down, and now there is a persecution from the government. They want to put cameras inside of churches. They want to put cameras inside the homes of Christians to see how they behave and to to judge them against the Communist Manifesto. And so this persecution that is, wasn't brought on by the Christians is creating a pit of circumstances in our church through a misunderstanding with the county. The county now believes that we're not a church and wants to tax us. And that is trying to be a pit of circumstances. It is something that that is regularly on my mind. It is something that is regularly something that I'm working on and I'm meeting with people and I'm going to meetings and I'm writing letters because it is something that I have to do to interface with the government that doesn't like to have churches in their county. And if I let that be my focus, if it is all that I am doing, then I will be in a pit of circumstances And more than anything else, I do pray about the situation with the county because if anybody's going to fix it, it's going to be God as the Christians in China are praying that their president would see the evils of communism and that he would leave them alone. But David prayed whatever his situation was and God was able to lift him up out of the miry clay and set his feet on solid rock. And the idea of setting your feet on solid rock means that I have sure footing if I feel like I'm being hit on all sides and I feel that I'm in a miry bog or a pit. I would have, I would not be sure what to do next, perhaps. There would be confusion But if God pulls me out of that situation, if God gives me an answer to that circumstance, I have my feet on solid ground, which means I am now stable. I now know what to do. And when God fixes things, when God gets you out of these types of situations, he doesn't just throw you a rope and hope for the best. He pulls you out and he puts you on a place that is stable that you know what to do that is how you know you've got an answer to that prayer is everything is clear because you are on solid ground and your steps are secure you you can see a straight path and that is how God would answer that sort of prayer and so in three to five David then says what does he do well he has a new song in his heart so he's going to tell people about it The answer to this prayer, David is going to proclaim that he is, that God is great, that he has done this thing. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. So David is understanding how he got into that situation, that God fixed it, and he's praising God for it, and he's telling people about it. And when we talk about things like a testimony, a testimony is a two-minute story of how God has changed your life. And people can pick deliverance of how they were before they were saved. Perhaps they were involved in drugs and alcohol or some sort of major behavioral sin, and God delivered them from that. That can be a testimony. Or if you have a great answer to prayer, 
that can also be a great testimony. Testimony is your story of how God has changed your life or something in your life. And so we need to understand these things when they happen, keeping some sort of prayer journal. When, you, when God rescues you out of something, we need to remember that. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, if you read that passage about how an annual celebration was to occur, God expected the Jewish people to remember that event for thousands of years, that it was supposed to be so impactful. And some people have an answer to prayer that is so impactful that it has changed the direction of their life, perhaps. And that can be a testimony. And you can join David in telling people about <clears throat> how great things God has done. Then in 6 through 10, David gives us a little formula on how he did it, on his participation. Because when we're praying for things, we usually don't just sit there in a dark room and hope that God will fix it for us. There's usually some level of participation that Christians need to work with what God is doing. And we participate in our sanctification. We participate in our <clears throat> prayer request. Now, when it's the Chinese government, there may be little that the Chinese people can do to participate in overthrowing the government or changing their mind. That sort of situation, it is just everybody has to pray for them and everybody has to pray for the government to stop. But if it is a financial pit that you are in, perhaps God is telling you to change your spending habits. That is your participation. And so what does David say? He says, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. And so in David's day, if you sinned, if you were just a person on the street and you sinned, you needed to go get an animal that you could afford, either a dove or a lamb, and take it to a synagogue or a temple. <clears throat> and they would sacrifice that animal and your blood, that blood of that animal would symbolically be placed over your sin, and you would gain forgiveness. That is how forgiveness in the Old Testament occurred, is that animal blood was applied to your sin. That's why we talk about Jesus in the New Testament. His blood is applied to our sin because it is a continuation of the Old Testament story, Jesus being the last sacrifice the last lamb, and his blood can be applied to every person on earth if they would only believe. But he says, you have given me an open ear. The original Hebrew literally means that you have dug out an ear. In other words, God has enabled David to hear. God has enabled David to understand what God is saying. Now, David is not getting new revelation. God is not speaking to David directly. But he says, then I said, Behold, I have come in a scroll of the book that is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. So what he is saying is, more than animal sacrifices, more than the rituals, of the Old Testament system, David is saying God wants us to get into his word, to read it, to study it, and to do what it says. And if you've been praying over and over and over and over for a solution to something that is going on in your life, perhaps your part is simply to get into your Bible, to study it, and let God speak to you through his word, Ask for God to give you an ear in your heart to understand what the Bible is saying to you and what you would do in response to this situation. And it may not be a direct correlation. If you have a financial pit that you're in, it may not be that you have to do something with your money. It may be God is allowing this financial pit because you have a strained relationship with a relative. 
and that is what God wants you to fix. And then, like magic, but it's a miracle, your financial problems may be solved. Sometimes God wants us to be a better Christian in these areas, and then these areas over here just go away. He then ends with 11 through 17 uh, for continued help. He's basically reminding God that uh, you took care of those enemies, you took care of this pit, but there are other enemies coming. Please be the same. Please do what you did back here, over here. Be a consistent God is what he's asking God to do. And he's saying that now in these other things that have not been taken care of, to deliver him, O Lord, make haste to help me. And it is the same sort of style of psalm in this section that David will use to uh, present to God all of his difficulties. But the big thing that he is saying and the thing that we should get out of this is 48. It says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written on my heart. If you are having a difficulty or a problem or something that you pray about that's not getting answered, perhaps God is only interested in your obedience. Perhaps God wants you to get into your Bible, to get into church, to get into Bible study. And through that, clean out, allow the Holy Spirit to clean out those things in your life. And then the other problems may just disappear. And so life is full of troubles, problems, and challenges. There are many things in this world that you cannot control, that you see, and it's a problem that you may be heartbroken about persecution here or persecution there. God wants us to come to him, to patiently wait, and to figure out his will, which is in the Bible, and to put it within our heart, that our behavior becomes a modern epistle of what God is saying to the world. It has been said that you may be the only Bible that some people will read. And you know they know that it's the true Bible if you read this Bible and it becomes part of your heart, that it becomes something that you do, that it becomes something you think about, that no matter where you're at, whether it's a fight with the government or fight with a person in your family or fight with money, you know that you are on the right track, that you are at the center of God's will because you are regularly in the Bible and it is changing your heart. And when God has changed your heart sufficiently, he will move you into another area that may be challenging, that may be difficult because this whole life is about one thing and that is your sanctification God making you holy, and it will end when Jesus Christ comes again. And so you can, like John did at the end of Revelation, pray for the rapid return of Jesus Christ. That is a valid prayer. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we may be people who will patiently wait for your answers. And while we are patiently waiting, we will get in and do your will, and we will write your law within our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this, and we ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day. We ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.